I know people are going to uh, continue to join, and that's fine. Um, I'm just going to say a couple words about using the technology and then um, introduce uh, Dr. Sukera. So um, as a reminder, um, uh, as we do this on uh, our VMR, it is really helpful if people want to use the chat function, which is uh, if, you're, if you don't know where it is, there's a dialog box. It looks like a little thought bubble up on the top left and you just click on that and it gives you uh, a place where you can write a message and that will stay right in the chat and I will monitor that as we go along if you have a question along the way. So we're gonna do the presentation for an hour and then we'll have uh, 15 minutes for dialogue and, and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, also, you know, as, as usual, um, keep yourself muted unless you're going to uh, be asking a question when we unmute the lines. It just makes it a lot easier. And <clears throat> if anybody is actually dialing in on a phone, it is really important to not put the phone on hold. That is uh, really important. Um, so let me just uh, uh, say a, a few words about um, just to introduce the summer series uh, of Grand Rounds at the IOL, which is really the, you know, the, the, the Grand Rounds for the Behavioral Health Network, um, which is actually throughout the year, a very rich Grand Rounds um, series. And it usually shuts down for the summer, but we decided, uh, particularly through the word uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, 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 work groups uh, at the Institute of Living and Rushford to keep the uh, summer slots open and so that we could focus on issues of racism and equity and diversity. And part of the idea for doing that is to make space. Um, you know, I think we all probably, I don't have to say a lot about that. I think we all pretty much feel a need for space to think about these issues, to talk about these issues, and frankly, to do work uh, on these uh, uh, issues. Um, we also wanted to do it because we wanted to formalize something. And, and, you know, there's a lot, I think, of really good discussion about, hey, it's good that we're, and we have a new awareness of racism, but what are we going to do to, um, you know, put things into structure so that they don't uh, just last for a month, but they are ongoing. So this is a, a step in that direction. So I, I want you to feel free to join any of them this summer. There's a... a, a a schedule that is being publicized and circulated. You can email me. Um, basically, they're Thursdays uh, at 12 o'clock uh, through the summer um, with this address. Um, and uh, and welcome to come from outside the system as well. It's a little trickier to get in uh, from outside the system, but we can help people do that. Um, so I want to just say a few words about uh, Dr. Sukera and then allow him to to. to to share his time with us. And I had mentioned earlier that I wanted to wish him a happy Canada Day, uh, day late. And of course, when I did that, I didn't even really know what it was about, but he uh, thankfully uh, let me know that it was about uh, really their in independence. Uh, shows you all the learning that, that we all need to do about so many things. Um, so I'll just, I'll, I'll read a little bit from his uh, very short, I have just a very abbreviated bio and then say a couple words to tee it up. Um, so, Dr. Javid Sukera is an associate uh, professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the Skulik School of Medicine and Dentistry at Western University in London, Ontario, Canada, where he is also a scientist at Western's Center for Education Research and Innovation. He practices in the pediatric chronic pain child and adolescent mental health care and transcultural mental health programs at London Health Sciences Center. Uh, in addition to his uh, MD, he's completed a PhD in health professions education. He's also participated on several provincial and national committees and councils and is currently the president of the Ontario Psychiatric Association. He's also chair of the London Police Services Board, which uh, is very interesting given the uh, conversations we're having in this uh, country exploring um, how does policing work, where do they report, uh, what, what's the oversight. In Canada, 
um, the oversight is, I think, citizen uh, organized boards, and he is the president of his board. His research include mental illness, uh, mental illness stigma reduction, and I'm hearing Pat, who's on the who's on the call, I'm sure, uh, uh, saying in addition to stigma, we like to use the word discrimination. Um, implicit bias in health professional education and facilitating authentic youth and community engagement with the health sector. He's clearly a passionate educator and uh, uh, he's, uh, if I get this right, I think he got his bachelor's in Canada, his uh, MD in Israel, his PhD in the Netherlands, and his adult and child psychiatry training at the University of Rochester, uh, and then did lead leadership training at, at Harvard's uh, Macy program, uh, which is very well known. Um, I've gotten to know him. I've had the pleasure of getting to know him through a mutual, very good uh, friend who's a mutual friend, and have uh, become an admirer of what he is doing and what he will do uh, to change the world. Uh, one. Um, phrase that I've appreciated in my conversations with him is that he is somebody that um, likes to interact with radical candor, and that is very much my experience of him. Um, I'm just going to mention, he didn't ask me to do this, but uh, if you are on Twitter, I would definitely follow him. He has a, a, a really great voice there, and it's at Javid Sukara is his uh, handle. So, uh, and uh, as I transition it over to you, um, Dr. Sukara. I just want to mention that uh, this very much links with the incredible work that's been going on here in the Behavioral Health Network, which links to the great work at the system level uh, led by Sarah Liu and um, Jeff Flax, who has been, I think, very forward-leaning um, uh, on the area, in the area of talking about uh, racism, looking at ourselves, looking at what we uh, need to do do the work that we need to do. So uh, with, that was a little bit too long, I'm sorry, Javid, but uh, I will now uh, turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak to everybody in the network and in the community in Hartford. Um, I am honored to present today, and a lot of my presentation uh, relates to my own journey through some of these topics, uh, but also some of the research that we've done uh, on the topic of bias as it relates to health professions. So I have nothing uh, pertinent to declare. And the objectives today are to describe the concept of bias, describe how a model for bias management might be applied but also provide examples of how implicit bias recognition and management can actually contribute to structural and systemic change. And as we start off today, I'd like for you to think about these questions. Take a few moments for yourself and reflect on what cultures you think you belong to. Keep in mind that what I'm referring to here can be visible or invisible culture. It could be your racial or ethnic culture. It could be the kind of uh, town that you grew up in. It could be a, a, the kinds of tribes or groups that you identify with. And think about the groups that mean the most to you and have made the biggest contribution to your identity. What I'm also going to challenge you to do is think about those groups and which of those groups that you belong to are considered dominant or part of the mainstream and which groups are non-dominant or underrepresented. Now, again, I'm talking about visible and invisible culture. The non-dominant group could relate to any time that you felt keenly or uniquely different from most of the people that were around you. And that's what I'm going to challenge you to reflect on the most right now. Those experiences, those non-dominant experiences of feeling vulnerable, of feeling different, I'm going to challenge you to think for a few minutes about how 
those experiences have influenced how you interact with others. I'll just pause and give you a minute to reflect. All right, so we'll get back to this, but keep, keep this thought in mind as we move forward. So I start off my presentations by giving everybody a window on some of the groups and tribes that I belong to. Now this slide depicts uh, a headline in our local newspaper from the early years of my practice. I came to psychiatry through a journey that's involved many twists and turns. I grew up uh, the child of immigrants to Canada from Pakistan. I trained in Israel, which is a very different and unique experience for someone who has an identity such as mine. And I really learned how to be a psychiatrist in the U.S. in a place very similar to Hartford, like Rochester, New York a place that uh, in many ways is a microcosm of America, of some of the social, economic, and racial segregation that we see in Amer many American cities across the country. So I came into practice with a huge interest in culture and in cross-cultural medicine, this idea that the care we provide for people who are different from ourselves is different for us. And I was always fascinated by equity, issues related to disparities, whether they were racial, economic. But it wasn't until the first few years of my practice that I realized that actually the biggest equity issue of my professional life is staring me in the face. And that's the inequity in which people with mental illness and addiction are treated by the healthcare system. In Canada, our system is very different than the U.S., but essentially, mental health is not adequately funded. So if two people walk into a hospital, one of them, for example, with physical illness and one of them with mental illness, usually the person with physical illness gets world-class care, and the person with mental illness gets a sheet of paper and a 12- to 18-month wait. This headline captures the fact that in our system, for many years there's a shortage of inpatient mental health beds. So there is a period of time when this story broke where if an adult needed to be admitted to an inpatient bed, they were waiting up to three weeks on a stretcher in a hallway for that inpatient bed. So it was living and working in this system that I began to appreciate that when my patients sought care, they were actually being dehumanized by the system. And what I was fascinated by was that this blame, this shame, this inequity, this discrimination was being perpetuated by people who were my friends and colleagues. These were people who were good people. They held high expectations of themselves and one another, but yet they were still perpetu perpetuating the problem. So I did what many of you do, and I began to lean into this, this lived experience. And as I learned more about the literature on stigma, what it was clear was that stigma is an example of discrimination and prejudice, negative attitudes and behaviors associated with mental illness and addiction that is directly associated with poor outcomes. We know that stigma leads to poor trust, poor treatment adherence. It adversely impacts someone's clinical presentation, their sense of self, their quality of life. But what we also know is that stigma, when internalized, can have its most profound and damaging effects. And that's because of the stereotypes that exist in society about mental illness. If we believe that everyone with mental illness might be weak and everybody believes it, the stigma is kind of baked into the system. So if we're struggling or suffering, we apply it to ourselves.
And tragically, stigma is an example of discrimination that's empirically linked with suicide. Because in so many circumstances, when someone feels like it's their fault and they're struggling, then it's just another thing that contributes to a sense of hopelessness and people giving up. What I also knew was that there was a vast literature on anti-stigma interventions, interventions to address this inequity, this prejudice, this bias, to improve care and outcomes. But as I drilled into each of them, each of them had their own shortcomings. So for example, there's a whole literature on the idea of protest. And what protest essentially is, is calling out the inequity. It's speaking up and and calling attention to it. And of course, we see this happen all the time. But the truth is, when we call things out like stigma, it actually produces a defensive, negative kickback reaction. And protest doesn't actually improve uh, stigmatizing attitudes. In fact, it can be sometimes harmful. And then there's the idea of social contact. Now, this is the hallmark of much of the stigma reduction we see. And this is the idea that instead of someone talking about stigma uh, from a research perspective or a clinical perspective, it's bringing in someone like you've all seen with lived experience of suffering who through their contact humanizes the problem and helps reduce the stereotypes. And indeed, social contact can be extremely powerful and effective. But what I found fascinating as I tried to critically deconstruct this is that social contact is most effective when the two people coming into contact are of equal status and equal power. So if we hear the stories of people who are like us, that makes a difference. But if people are not like us, then social contact actually has a potential to reinforce negative stereotypes. What I also reflected on was that clinical education is social contact based. But if you're working, for example, in a busy emergency department or crisis center, where the contact you have is with people who are struggling and at their worst state, then perhaps that social contact also feeds negative stereotypes. And the third, of course, is education. We know that education is transformation, right? That we teach people that mental illness and addiction are real. We debunk the myths. We educate, we educate, we educate. But we also know that education alone isn't enough. Education doesn't actually cut to the deeper attitudes that are developed and reinforced through the system, the structures. So I thought about this and I realized in my experience, like Dr. Kendi says, that when racist ideas resound, denials that those ideas are racist typically follow. When racist policies resound, Denials that those policies are racist also follow. Denial is the heartbeat of racism, beating across ideologies, races, and nations. It is beating within us. In my experience in Canada, denial was a huge part of the problem when we talked about inequity. And it was a huge part of the problem when we talk about stigma. Because so much of our approach to these issues is based on this idea that there's a good group of us who don't discriminate, and a bad group of us who do. And perhaps the only way to make things better is for the good people to bring the bad people into a workshop and make the problem better. But I'm sure as you can appreciate as I describe this, that's just flipping ridiculous, right? This whole frame, this pointing the finger, the amount of energy that we spend talking about us who supposedly get it, and them who supposedly don't. This polarization, it's just burning energy that isn't moving us forward. So the thought I had was, maybe we can look, teach, and learn about stigma as a form of bias in a different way. Perhaps instead of pointing the finger, we can address bias by looking in the mirror at ourselves. And I thought and learned that implicit bias may be a construct that could be useful. In that reflection, like Dr. Kendi says, I thought, how can I critique their ethnic racism and ignore my ethnic racism? 
That is the central double standard in ethnic racism, loving one's position on the ladder above other ethnic groups and hating one's position below that of other ethnic groups. It's failing to recognize that racist ideas we consume about others come from the same restaurant and the same cook who use the same ingredients to make different degrading dishes for us all. So with that, we're gonna take a video break. blamers how many of you when something goes wrong the first thing you want to know is whose fault it is hi my name is Brene I'm a blamer <laughs> let me just tell you this quick story so this is a couple years ago when I first realized the magnitude to which I blame I'm in my house I'm on white slacks and a pink sweater set and I'm drinking a cup of coffee in my kitchen it's a full cup of coffee I drop it on the tile floor it goes into a million pieces splashes up all over me and the first, I mean, a millisecond after it hit the floor, right out of my mouth is this, damn you, Steve. <laughs> Who's my husband? Because let me tell you how fast this works for me. So Steve plays water polo with a group of friends. And the night before he went to go play water polo. And I said, hey, make sure you come back at 10 because you know, I can never fall asleep into your home. And he got back like at 10.30. And so I went to bed a little bit later than I thought. Ergo, my second cup of coffee that I probably would not be having had he come home when we discussed. Therefore, and so the rest of the story is I'm cleaning up um, the kitchen. Steve calls, caller ID. I'm like, hey. He's like, hey, what's going on, babe? <laughs> what's going on? Um, <laughs> So I'll tell you exactly what's going on. <laughs> I'm cleaning up the coffee that spilled all, like dial tone. Because <laughs> he knows. How many of you go to that place when something bad happens, the first thing you want to know is whose fault is it? I'd rather it be my fault than no one's fault. Because why? Why? Because it gives us some semblance of control. But here, if you enjoy blaming... This is where you should stick your fingers in your ear and do the no, 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 no thing because I'm getting ready to ruin it for you. Because here's what we know from the research. Blame is simply the discharging of discomfort and pain. It has an inverse relationship with accountability. Accountability, by definition, is a vulnerable process. It means me calling you and saying, hey, my feelings were really hurt about this and talking. It's not blaming. Blaming is simply a way that we discharge anger. People who blame a lot seldom have the tenacity and grit to actually hold people accountable because we spend all of our energy raging for 15 seconds and figuring out whose fault something is. And blaming is very corrosive in relationships and it's one of the reasons we miss our opportunities for empathy. Because when something happens and we're hearing a story, we're not really listening we're in the place where I was making the connections as quickly as we can about whose fault something was. So I can't see folks, but what I usually ask after showing this video is how many of you are blamers? What the video highlights for us is that essentially this is the way we're wired, right? This is how we as humans deal with some of these challenging situations. And what I began to appreciate, like I said earlier, is so much of these, so, so many of these difficult conversations about equity are steeped in blame and shame. It's such an important component of how we deal with this. So if the idea is we need to start looking in the mirror instead of pointing the finger, 
Well, how can we do that? Well, first of all, we have to resist the urge to dichotomize everything because it isn't about us versus them or good versus bad. Bias itself can be destructive or constructive. It can be positive or negative. Now, we often talk about destructive bias, which is in the top right quadrant. But what we also know is that a lot of biases exist to keep us safe. They exist as an alarm that can be constructive. We also know that bias that's positive can be destructive, especially when it comes to the biases we have um, that are towards people who are like us, affinity bias, right? Destructive biases limit our opportunity to design things in ways that are inclusive. Destructive biases can also be blind spots when we're making judgments. For example, we're much more likely to send someone home who's still at risk to themselves if we're rooting for them, if we have that positive bias. But at the same time, positive bias can be constructive. I tell people all the time that when my father first came to Canada in the 60s, he describes how he had a hard time finding an apartment because literally there were signs and windows that said, no colored people. And he was walking in Toronto and saw another gentleman who was Indian. And they both walked by each other, turned around, ran up to each other and gave each other a hug. So these positive biases that we have can also be what bring us together, what feeds a sense of belonging and connection. This isn't about black and white. But we also know that despite our best intentions, these implicit biases that exist outside of our awareness, despite our best intentions, affect our decision making. This slide highlights a study with thrombolytic treatment for heart attacks for black compared to white patients. And these physicians explicitly weren't racist. They believed in fairness and equity, but they were still less likely to recommend this treatment to black compared to white patients. And their behavior correlated with their implicit bias, the bias that existed outside of their conscious awareness. Why this is important is because these biases influence our judgments. Rarely do we ever take observable data and not filter it through our own beliefs, assumptions, and cultural and historical meanings, those identities or tribes that I mentioned earlier on. But what we also know from the work that we do is that there are many in our communities who experience such significant and traumatizing bias from us that they don't trust the system. And when we have that brief moment in time where they intersect with us, we represent every experience they've ever had with the system. They're sensitized to perceive us as shaming and blaming them based on the experiences that they've had. So if we know that implicit bias influences our behavior despite our best intentions, well, what do we do about it? So our early research looked at how this happens in, an, in a healthcare setting. We looked at deconstructing implicit bias in a pediatric emergency department. And what you'll appreciate is that when people walk into the system with mental illness and addiction, a stigmatizing label gets attached implicitly that this person's gonna be time consuming, that they're gonna be dangerous or unpredictable, but also that they're unfixable. So what happened was that led physicians and nurses to avoid them because there's something about our training that doesn't make us feel useful in this situation and the implicit tendency was to avoid. But that led these health professionals to feel frustrated and helpless. It didn't feel good. But when we asked patients and caregivers in the same study, they perceived this avoidance as judgment and discrimination. And they too were frustrated and helpless. And yes, there were structural factors that contributed, the lack of funding, fear, history, media, but the cycle was spinning over and over. In the same study, we asked, well, what do we do? How do we make this better? And the study found that participants suggested that it required rehumanizing care. 
that rather than seeing this person as a label, that if we could foster seeing them as a unique human being who's looking for help, and we foster connecting to them as a fellow human being, as someone that we know what it feels like to ask for help because we've asked for help. And if we encourage explicit behavior change, like engaging instead of avoiding, that maybe they can start to, people can start to feel useful and maybe we can break the cycle. One of the earliest things we did to hold up the mirror was use the Implicit Association Test, or IAT. This is an online metric of response time that any of you can take. It's available at implicit.harvard.edu. And it's the best proxy for, for uh, implicit bias because what it measures is your bias between different concepts. It's not without controversy, though, and I'm going to speak to that a little bit later in the conversation. In our early research, we wanted to understand what happens when health professionals are forced to look in the, mir the mirror at themselves and their, their biases. And what we found was somewhat surprising. So we know from the literature that if we get feedback about ourselves that we disagree with, we're likely to discard it and not perceive it as useful. But feedback about bias was a different kind of feedback. It wasn't that it was inconsistent with what we believe about ourselves. It's that it's inconsistent with a fantasy version of ourselves that we strive to achieve, but that's impossible to achieve. So our participants said, well, I can't possibly have bias. This test is stupid. It's rigged. It's a setup because I'm a professional and professionals don't have bias. That's who we are. But of course I have bias because, you know, I'm, I'm a human too. And that's who I really am. What this study highlighted for us, it took us a bit sideways in our work, but what we realized was there's something about our culture that actually encourages us to compartmentalize who we are from what we do. If learning that we have flaws is deeply emotional and challenging, it is made further challenging by this idea of aspiring towards something that's impossible to achieve. So what did we do? Well, we leaned into, into it even further. We thought, you know, if identity is a big part of how we reconcile feedback about bias, let's take a group of people who work in mental health, physicians, residents, nurses, and let's give them feedback about their biases about patients with mental illness. Because at the very core, their identity is wrapped up in being sort of stigma fighters. What we found through these studies was, again, this is a different kind of feedback. Most of the time when we give feedback to people, we're encouraged not to say anything about who you are. It's about what you did. It's content focused. And that's because research shows that feedback about who we are hijacks our ability to act on the feedback. But our study found something different. It was a paradox. This was an example about feedback about who we are that was denigrated, that was trashed, that was totally poked holes through, yet our participants perceived this form of self-related feedback as actionable. You can see this in the quote. This is someone who said, well, this, this, the results are wrong. But obviously, it's important, and this is something that I can use to change, which is very, very different. In another study, we used visual methods called rich pictures, which allow participants to actually draw and reflect in a different way. This rich picture came from someone who works in mental health, who described how they reconcile this tension between who they are and who they strive to be. They described how even though when working with a patient, they encourage the patient to speak out and not be afraid, but yet they themselves, even as a, a mental health professional, have suffered with anxiety. And they described how there's two parts of their brain, part of their brain that advocates for their patients and part of their brain who's ashamed to advocate for themselves. As you can see in the quote, Participants said, you know, I've come to terms with it. So 
Working towards this means checking your biases, realizing when you might have let a bias come in between an interaction or a decision. I think it's something we strive for, but I'm not going to wake up tomorrow and say nobody has biases, right? We all have them. So I think it's something you strive for, accepting that it's not necessarily going to be achieved. In another study, we looked at what happens when we train people to be more critically reflective about their biases. So what we did was that initial study about stigma in a unit, we used that to co-design a training program. And we delivered that training program and then followed people longitudinally through their learning environment after we gave the training. This study highlighted a very important point about structural and systemic bias. So in the contents of a culture that's a quick fix culture, if the bias is that mental illness is unfixable and the bias behavior is to avoid, just making people aware of their biases, just holding up the mirror, actually creates more tension and makes people feel more helpless. I mean, think about it. If you take a group of hardworking people with high expectations and say, guess what? There's this thing called implicit bias, and no matter how hard you try, it still may lead you to discriminate. It actually doesn't help. And in fact, it can harm. But when you encourage them not just to recognize the bias, but to actually change their behavior, what we found was these participants, you know, right after the training said, this is great and this is important, but you know what? I'm going back to that same biased system. And how much can I do? How much can I change? But over time, as the attitude changed and the behavior changed, people began to critically look at systemic bias in the system. One of the participants described how the training highlighted for them that the way that they triage patients around violence prevention was very stigmatizing and biased. And together, the unit advocated for a change to the policy. So what we found fascinating about that is within this environment, people who feel comfortable with one another who learn together and work together can actually begin to co-construct systemic change. So what does this all mean? You know, how do we bring this all together? If we think back to the us versus them dilemma, the dichotomization, Dr. Kendi really sums it up. He says that when we're reflecting on this, we need to know that they are responsible for their racist ideas. I'm not. I'm responsible for my racist ideas. They are not. To be anti-racist is to let me be me, be myself, be my imperfect self. What we learned is that if we hold up the mirror to our biased selves, who we see is someone that is flawed, that is vulnerable, and that has shortcomings. But if our teaching and learning about this topic is set up within a toxic culture of perfectionism, where we push people to do more, to work harder towards an impossible version of ourselves, then perhaps we could cause more harm than good. The model that came out of our work highlights that we can get feedback about our biases, we can critically reflect we can change our behavior and explicitly role model that new behavior. But there's two things that are necessary ingredients for this to work. The first is putting a framework around it that emphasizes that you can strive for that ideal version of yourself. But unless you actually embrace your imperfect self and accept that self, you're not going to be able to move things forward. The other thing was sharing and dialogue. So in our longitudinal evaluation, the training worked in some settings and it didn't work in others. And the secret sauce was actually that when you train people who work together and you train them together, teams actually become social reinforcers. So where training like this works is when people walk out feeling comfortable with their team members to be open 
about their vulnerabilities. And when people see themselves as change agents, not by doing, but actually by being. If we think of all the research, all that exists, you know, trying to distill it into a talk is challenging. But there's a lot of evidence on how we can be anti-bias, how we can be anti-racist. There's a lot of books. You're hearing a lot of speakers throughout the summer. I'm sure everybody is doing their own set of research and reflection. As you reflect on the questions I asked you earlier about those moments where you felt vulnerable, where you felt different, I challenge you to think about whether your natural instinct was to go with the flow and shift into cycles of blame and shame. Because that's what we do, right? That's, that's how our brains work. Resisting that takes effort. But it's not going to work unless we think about our humanity, our shared humanity. And if we think about how important who we are is as we strive to be better. So, for example, there's a, there's a whole set of literature on challenging norms. If you have a biased interaction, well, what people often challenge you to do is imagine what you would have done different or what you would have said different if that person hadn't fit with that stereotype. As a man, if I have a biased interaction with a woman, my challenge is to think about how gender plays a role in that interaction for me and how I may have been socialized about gender. What I say is that's really important, but from my perspective, it's actually all about courage. It's courage for two things. The first is the courage to go against the norm. Because bias is baked into the system, confronting systemic bias is to speak up and go against what everyone's believed for so long. It's to unlearn something we've all learned. And doing that takes courage. Everyone's going to draw a different line. There's so many times where we feel powerless, where we feel vulnerable. And we push people to go into scary places that feel dangerous. But what we have to appreciate is that, is that for each of us, Tiptoeing over that comfort line is going to be different. We should definitely not be pushing people into territory that feels traumatizing, triggering, or dangerous. But at the same time, instead of just looking for safe spaces, we need to create brave spaces where people feel comfortable to tiptoe over that comfort line. And that's the courage that I'm talking about. But it's also the courage to be vulnerable. And that matters because if we want to see people beyond stereotypes and beyond labels, and we want to be mindful and connect to that complex human being we're working with, of course, we need to have compassion. We need to draw deep from that well. But what we also need to have is compassion for ourselves. How hard are we on ourselves? How often do we practice self-forgiveness, self-compassion, and even self-love for us to be able to move us forward in the overwhelming amount of pain and injustice that we and many others in our communities are bearing witness to, the only way to have compassion is to have compassion for ourselves. And of course, we need to talk about it. We need to have conversations. We need to get outside of our own heads. But when we know that our tendency is to avoid those difficult conversations, we have to actively seek connection. And what I'm not saying is to place the emotional labor of this on people who are experiencing trauma or members of oppressed groups. It's work we have to do by getting outside of our own heads and critically unlearning assumptions we've held for our whole lives. This is a painful thing. It's a painful 
and difficult thing to do. Reconciling our privilege does not mean denying our strengths. It does not mean denying our vulnerabilities. What it also means is giving ourselves the freedom to recognize that we're all products of a biased system. In some ways, what we can do is depersonalize the problem while personalizing the solution. So what do I mean about the system? Dr. Kendi says, changing minds is not a movement. Critiquing racism is not activism. Changing minds is not activism. An activist produces power and policy change, not mental change. If a person has no record of power or policy change, then that person is not an activist. Part of the problem is the dichotomization that exists in our culture isn't just one of us versus them that's problematic. It's also of individuals versus the system. And that's because for too long in healthcare or education, we've taken wicked, complex, nuanced problems and approached them by throwing a bunch of people into a room and giving them a workshop and checking a box. And we all know how counterproductive that can be. But instead of our tendency to then point the finger at the system, addressing bias requires us to remember we are part of that same system. And in fact, we can begin to co-construct change within that system through our very presence. Now that does not absolve our leaders of their responsibility. In any meeting, any session, any opportunity where structural change is possible, it's asking ourselves who needs to be in this room that's not here. And it's co-designing that structural change with people who are affected by it. I say all the time that if 12 men were tasked with designing a women's bathroom, we wouldn't get a very user-friendly product. So why don't we co-design our policies, our structures, our systems, our spaces with people who use those spaces? Inclusive co-design emphasizes that individuals are systems and systems are individuals. We are all part of this together. And for things to change, we can change at an individual level, but that's not enough. It's more important to be a part of policy, power, and structural change. Now, I've punctuated this presentation with quotes from Dr. Kendi, who has written a fantastic book uh, about anti-racism called How to Be an Anti-Racist. And it's probably one of the best books on this topic that's come out uh, in recent times. So I strongly encourage it. A lot of the messages in his book align with some of our research. And given the time and context we find ourselves in, I thought that quotes from him punctuating this presentation can help shed light on how these interconnected systems of discrimination, injustice, and prejudice, this intersectional approach to understanding and appreciating how power and hierarchy manifests will be helpful. So I'm going to conclude with a video to bookend the presentation, but I want to give you a concluding quote from Dr. Kendi, who says, while many people are fearful of what could happen if they resist, I am fearful of what, I, of what could happen if I don't resist. And with that, we're going to watch another video. What is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? 
Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, I'm down. I know what it's like down here and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no, you want a sandwich? Um, empathy is a choice and it's a vulnerable choice because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Great. Well, with that, I will conclude my presentation. So, uh, I'm going to mute everybody. Hang on. Um, can you hear me? Javid, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, uh, so I'm going to try to transition us to some questions here. And so, and first of all, I just really want to thank you uh, for, uh, it was an incredible presentation for many reasons. I won't remember them all. One of them is um, sort of to your point about, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not just about doing, but being. Um, I think uh, your style of presenting has a has a way of um, uh, gives us gives me a feel, gives us, I think, all a feel for what it must be like to sort of be with you as you're doing your work. And and I think uh, that's extraordinary, and and how important this is, you know, to you. And I think it's really important as we ourselves are on this journey. And uh, and I see people stepping up who feel compelled by the way that they, you know, want to be in the work. And they may not have the words yet, um, and, um, and, and we all need to figure that out together. But I, I'm really, uh, I think it's going to uh, link to inspiration that's been happening already here. Um, I also love that you use the word wicked, because I don't know, I think it's a Canada thing. Um, but I love that. Um, and, and actually, and thirdly, the topic and, and what you specifically presented, it really gets, it just very timely with what we're going through and questions that we have. So uh, I'm going to encourage the audience. I have a couple of uh, questions uh, that came uh, through texting, which is fine if you know my cell phone. Um, but I just, uh, we are still getting used to this platform. It would be obviously much better to be in an actual room. Um, and I think even on Zoom, we're used to kind of getting a room feel. 
Uh, but I just want to remind, remind people that there is chat function. If you go up to that, um, if, if you're on a computer, um, maybe it's not so easy if you're getting it on your phone, but there, if you're on a computer, there is that uh, chat uh, button, which is like a thought window up on the left. You can put in your question there. I'm going to just uh, call it a couple people who have, uh, who have questions, and then maybe after that, open it up. So um, let's see. Well, the best way to do this might be to i'm going to try actually i have pat's right there so i'm going to try to unmute pat so pat reamer who maybe that's not going to work unmute there you go um who uh, for those uh, who may be joining uh, i knew because i invited some people from outside uh is uh, the president of the behavioral health network here um, at Hartford Healthcare, and I'm extraordinarily lucky to be working in a dyad uh, uh, leadership uh, pair with her. Uh, Pat, I think you had a question or comment. Yeah, I did. Um, first, I want to echo uh, John's comments about how relevant it is um, right now, but also it was probably one of the most, best presentations I've seen in the last year. It just really spoke to me. And what I was struck by and I wanted to comment on is as you, because I really do believe that people with behavioral health disorders are discriminated against, like black people, like, you know, any other oppressed group. Um, and but as we think about the recovery model, as I heard you describe the way you move into addressing your biases, you are talking exactly so articulately about the recovery model and how we need to allow our patients to have their voices and to address our own biases with that because it's, it's so critical. And it's a hard concept for those of us like me that have been in the business for 35 years. And I was thinking about my own evolution. And I think it's probably taken me a good 10 years to get to a point where I absolutely believe what the advocates in this state say, which is nothing about us without us, and think that all of our decisions in a behavioral health system should be made with people who have the issues at the table. Um, so uh, you certainly focused a lot on mental illness as a stigma. Um, do you see it in the same way, the way I'm describing it in terms of discrimination because of the oppression that they experience? So it's just sort of another layer. If somebody is black with a mental illness, we treat them perhaps doubly differently. I do. I think that there's a lot of, of parallels. Um, it really becomes about power, in my opinion. I think um, our research looked at bias through this lens, but we made a deliberate connection early on to say that learning about bias through this lens towards people with mental illness can actually teach us a lot about bias as it relates to race or gender, or addiction. But what we also began to realize in, in, through some of the work that I'm doing now around addiction stigma and structural stigma is that bias itself at once is individual, it's social and structural, and they all feed off of each other at all times. So I think that that, that is around systemic racism and some of the conversations we're having right now is exactly where it's at. Um, and when I talk to people who are anti-racism scholars, we've had similar conversations. What that doesn't mean, though, is that we've got it all figured out. I think that's where the challenge lies. Um, there's different ways to understand some of these different problems. And we need to do a lot more work and a lot more research. But what, what it requires is to resist two things that are baked into our culture. One is the one and done approach. So I had earlier talked about the IAP, and I wanted to speak about that briefly. So this test, this implicit association test, we did a review of how it's used for teaching and learning about bias. What we found was kind of disturbing. Most of the time, people treat the IAT as a metric of bias, and they use it to evaluate if bias training works or doesn't work. But some of the time, rather than as a metric of bias, 
it's used as a trigger for reflection. What I argue is we have to resist the temptation to think of bias as something that can be measured and fit because it's a lifelong process. It's a constant process. It's not one and done. It's not a checkbox. Um, and it's, it's got to be about continuous striving. But the, the idea that we measure it also perpetuates the idea that we can just fix it when, when that's not the case. We have to constantly be working to do better. The other problem, other than the one and done fixing measuring issue, is power. And through recovery models or through user-based co-design, some of the natural resistance that happens is when people have a hard time when it feels like you're losing power. That's why I think Brene Brown, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of her work, but she captures that very well when she highlights that we have a natural tendency when we feel like we're losing control to grab on and seek more control. And I think that's where the resistance lies is this is a natural tendency and we have to allow ourselves to validate that sometimes this is a natural tendency. The defensive reaction that many of us can have when we feel threatened can be natural. So while we shouldn't necessarily feel ashamed for something that can be natural, we do have a responsibility to recognize how our natural defensiveness can actually perpetuate inequity. We see that all the time in, in research as well when there's the, the push for evidence, you know, everything's evidence, evidence-based, evidence-informed. And that's a culture, of course, the biomedical culture many of us are steeped in. But I'll never forget early in my experience, I was uh, at a, a learning activity with indigenous community members in Canada. And one of the youth said, I'll never forget it. They said, your evidence was constructed through your lens through your people. None of my people were a part of your evidence. So that, that kind of challenge really challenges us to listen deeply and with humility and unlearn some of those things that we've internalized over time. Because the truth is, of course, we're going to be evidence-informed. Of course, we want to do things right. But like many of the authors in this field talk about, what our focus needs to be is not on being right. It's more about getting it right. I love it. Um, you can hear Thank me you. again, Javi. Can you hear me? Okay. And um, I think that Adrian Bentman has a question. It's the thing I can't see if she's on the VMR. So I'm going to try to unmute everybody. And Adrian, if you can hear. Um, I'm going to go, go ahead and let's, let's see how that goes. Okay, okay. That, that, that's taking let's a shot. shot. Adrian, John, if everybody can mute themselves, then let's start talking. Yeah, I'm going to mute everybody here. Adrian, can you hear me? Okay. That, that that didn't really work. So I'm going to, I actually have uh, in text uh, a, 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 a sense of her question. Um, and But first of all, she says, excellent, excellent presentation, research plus application. Uh, um, and in very for what we're going, you know, what we're going through here and the work that we're doing. And I would add, you know, it, it has to feel like work and it, there's pain involved in, in sort of breaking down muscle to, to be able to build muscle. And um, her question, and this is, and I'm going to add to so my inflection to her question. And we're, one of the things we're struggling with, uh, the leading edge of, of some of our learning as we uh, in the BHN um, have, um, have set up, uh, and when I say we, I use that liberally, <laughs> so not me, like groups here have set up uh, spaces to be able to talk and dialogue about difference, you know, not just race difference, but Clearly, right now, that's taken front and center, and there's a lot of energy for it. And so, one of and and so, to what you were talking about, I really liked. Uh, it's not so much about safe spaces, and we were struggling because we didn't want to be dishonest about it. 
and and we're and we we were struggling with you know do we say safe enough spaces like what what would capture so but to say brave spaces I think there's a lot embedded in that and I'd be interested in in you articulating a little bit more around cut two things um, one is you know uh, on the one hand we want to make room we want want to continually make room for more to come into the into literally into the room um you know and that and and, and when you ask for that it comes and it be, it becomes difficult right to for for people to bring a, the some of the gut stuff when it starts uh, to become you know people give a, a an, an express something that can be hurtful to somebody else that's not easy so uh and in the end of the, at the end of the day as you talked uh, I think you used the word, you know, this process is ultimately anti-racist and anti-bias. And, um, and so how do we draw that boundary? And then to add to that, um, I think we we're trying to work on is, is how to develop the group musculature to allow um, dialogue where people, you know, come in to the room with something and they may think about two minutes later, oh, my Oh my God, I can't believe I said that. Um, where did that come from? And people in the room are thinking the same thing. But it feels necessary that it needs to be in the dialogue. And and how do you, um, how do you, you know? I guess I don't know if I'm articulating the like, but, you know, because in in psychiatry and in, in, in mental health, we're used to group process. We're used to making room for. And I myself, in, you know, doing this for a long time, have a certain sense of muscle memory around group group work to almost everything but issues around you know let's just say racism um and so trying to figure out what that feels like what's the process that a group goes through when uh, controversial you know opinions come into the room anyway your thoughts on that yeah so you know we do have that training and we have a robust literature to draw on in terms of process and all of that applies to these types of conversations um there's a lot of sort of experiences, I think, that have colored how I think, and of course, I'm still learning. I remember early, early on, um, very early in, in our work, I started with just a seminar for medical students in their third year clerkship. And when I finished the presentation that year in my feedback, uh, of course, it was generally positive, but there was that one comment. Um, and the student said, it was great, but would have been better if the instructor took a less patronizing and judgmental tone. And I really internalized that. I really poured over that because I think this whole us versus them, there can be a tendency, a, a well-meaning tendency to come across as righteous or preachy, but the name of the game has to be humility, right? I think humility has to be the mantra that facilitators of these groups and conversations repeat to themselves. The other thing is you need to set intentions when you walk into that kind of space. So it, it really is most effective if everybody that's in their space is there by informed consent and with the intention of working towards and being part of something better. Um, in our early trainings, we would explicitly go around and say, why are you here? And even when uh, some participants said, well, we're here because we get an honoraria for being here. That was important to throw into the space to be honest about why people were there. The other piece is around the toxic perfectionism, right? There's no way that that's going to go right. So if you approach it with humility and you know that this will never really be that, um, it just gives you space sometimes as a group leader or facilitator to constantly think of everything you do as an opportunity for learning and unlearning. The, the thing that I started to do uh, midway through any of these facilitations is I always carved out space, meaningful space during the presentation to be intentional about feedback, to be intentional about what went well and what didn't go well, uh, and to make sure participants knew that that feedback was important and constructive. And although there are opportunities for anonymous feedback for people who feel comfortable it was striving to create space where people could give feedback about the conversation or session during the session. Because a lot of times with polarizing topics like this, and I'm, I'm living this now in my role with the police board, there's some very extreme toxic critics 
that sometimes tear things down and just can be destructive. Um, and I think that that's something I'm still working on how to figure out. But the ideal is to take the constructive stuff and, and emphasize to people that um, there are opportunities for constructive change in how the conversations happen, how they're structured, um, that those conversations can happen within groups or individually. And it's to continue to create open lines of communication between the, the group leaders and the team. Um, okay, I'm taking notes furiously and trying to field questions on my text. And as we still get used to this technology, I don't even know what it means when something comes up and says it's streaming. Um, and so, let, and actually, for a minute, just because you mentioned it, and in terms of you know um, your own experience, um, I, I, there's so much to, to you know ask you about. Uh, but I, I, for the sake of the of brevity in this in this presentation, I mean, is there something that you would want to say about either the work with the police board, but actually going back to you know your training in Israel and and how that you know has informed you know, you're being pulled into this work. The, the Israel training could be a whole presentation in and of itself, for sure. Um, I think a lot of what I describe to people is that part of my development of my professional identity happened concurrently during a time of personal transformation. And I think what that speaks to is we saw it reflected in some of the work. When we talk about professional development, we have to also be talking about personal development when it comes to these topics. If we seek to compartmentalize ourselves um, rather than, than embracing our humanity, that, that I think is going to be problematic. Part of how I navigated being in this conflict or dealing with the developing identity and intentions and how I still try to navigate it is to center it on, you know, very basic humanist values that I, I feel driven by. But uh, in terms of the work with the police, it's, it's been a very uh, challenging thing. Now, this is a serendipitous role. It's an appointment. In our jurisdiction, police services are governed by civilian boards. So our seven-member board has the mayor of the city, two city councillors, uh, three provincial or state, for your equivalent, appointees, and to, in one city appointee. I got a random call from uh, someone who heard me speak somewhere and, and asked if I wanted to be on the board. I had no clue what it involved, but I just leaned into it. Uh, and being chair was also not something I necessarily asked for because I thought it was going to be a quiet year this year. That was in the century of January 2020. What I've found, though, is that listening is so important and not taking up space is so important. I am not black. So even though I have a different identity, being an ally requires me to create space and listen and not to take space. It requires me to not become defensive when I receive feedback or comments. Uh, and it requires me to reflect on my own privilege all the time and not to center my own feelings all the time. That centering of our own feelings is, I think, part of uh, the conversations I have with leaders and the coaching and training I do. It's so hard to not center our feelings when we're coming at things with good intentions. It's also important to remember that we're part of these systems, right? So by virtue of me being a chair of a board, I have privilege. Um, and, and there are things I can understand and approach in certain ways and things that I can't. I've tried to approach this role in an academic way. You know, I, I tell people in the media, I'm not a politician. I'm not looking for quick wins. Uh, I want us to be thoughtful about what we can change. But when I say that, I have to appreciate that there are communities who are experiencing trauma every day whose lives are on the line. And for them, my, my speaking of being thoughtful and deliberate can also be quite invalidating because they've heard the same thoughtful, deliberate, incremental uh, calls for reform that haven't created transformational change. So it's a tight rope. It definitely is. But I think, you know, you have to navigate it with humility at the end of the day. I love it. That's exactly, I think, what was in the questions. There's a number of other questions. I'm just going to sneak one more in. I know we're going to go over by a minute. Uh, 
um, but I'm going to paraphrase it. And, and, it, and it links to this. It, you know, it's, the question is something like, um, this is, I am, I am really compelled to do something. Um, I'm not black, in, you know, and, um, uh, and what I've been, uh, what I'm hearing from my black friends and colleagues is, is something a little bit sometimes like, uh, you know, talk is a, um, and I'm glad that you're standing next to me. But really, what I need you to do is is uh, be part of the solution. And and so this sort of question about uh, how much of you know the motivation for, for our awareness is motivated again, sort of by people's own our own you know guilt, like oh I feel better because it looks like I'm doing something to be an ally versus true allyship. You know I don't know. I mean it's a big topic for a couple minutes. But do you have a, a, a some words about that? Well, again, it's it's about that self forgiveness. You know, you're you're going to make mistakes. It's just inevitable. Um, but you can't call yourself an ally. Like that's the very definition of allyship is we don't get to call ourselves allies. It's something you work hard for, and you know you might get get recognized by a community for being that way. But then you know what? You wake up the next morning and you just have to start all over again. That's just the very yeah. nature of, of the process. So. The only way to do something like that is with humility when we know we're going to bumble through. You know, one of the gifts that I say of, of working with young people is they challenge me to be the most authentic version of myself every day, right? So, sure. you know, I think of that in terms of uh, a healthy kind of self-deprecating uh, approach that I'm going to get this wrong. I'm going to bumble through. I just have to do my very best uh, yeah. to be intentional and to be humble, uh, but also to do and not forget to lean into some of the difficult conversations that need to happen. Perfect. That's a wonderful uh, note to end on. And it also reminds me, I spent, I had a meeting with a child psychiatrist this morning and there may, there may be something about working with kids. Um, it was very rich discussion about this. So I just make sure that I thank you, Dr. Sukera for spending your time with us. I mean, it's going to have impact far and wide. I can tell you um, lots of people have been, uh, asking me in, in a variety of ways as if it's going to be how it's going to it, it's being recorded it will be accessible on health stream we may make it accessible in other ways and, and javid is also his email i think out there people do have uh, questions and want to follow up or you can always uh, come through for me so and with that thanks everybody for uh, being part of this and uh, have a wonderful uh, extended weekend thanks kevin Bye, everyone. I'm just going to disconnect from my...